Welcome back. It's been an interesting week of news and joining me now to discuss the top stories is One Nation MP Sarah Game. Sarah, great to have you on Bernardi. Thank you for joining me again. I've got to start with Qantas, which has dominated the headlines this week. Of course, the news that CEO Alan Joyce's early retirement after the airline was grilled in a Senate inquiry. It had a huge number of issues, including ghost flights, not providing refunds appropriately, unused flight credits. The new boss, Vanessa Hudson, has promised to make swift changes to win back consumer confidence. And your party boss, Pauline Hanson, said they should start by getting rid of the welcome to country. I'm with her 100%. Where do you think they should start? It, it's absolutely the right thing to do. It's the minimum that they need to do, Corey, at this point. After we've seen Alan Joyce with a $24 million golden handshake, we've had billions of Australian taxpayers' money to bail out uh, the Qantas group, um, only to be met with an acknowledgement to country that, frankly, most people don't want. So I fully support that being abolished as the absolute minimum step. Do you reckon it's going to happen? I think it might happen, especially if we see what happens with this voice referendum. It might happen. I think there was a lot of backlash after they used uh, what really could be seen to be taxpayer money to brand their planes with the Yes campaign. And I think a lot of people were very unhappy with uh, the way Qantas seems to have taken a side with this. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think um, it would signal a new direction for the airline, less virtue signalling, more passenger customer focus. Hey, you mentioned the voice referendum. Now, South Australia is shaping up as a must-win state with the yes vote just nudging ahead, albeit it's, it's got a declining vote. But 18% of people here are still undecided officially. What do you reckon the campaign needs to do to get them over line? How do you think it's going to play out? I think people need to understand that voting yes in this upcoming referendum is voting yes to a blank cheque uh, from Australians. And that is going to have devastating consequences and those consequences are going to be felt most by the most vulnerable in our society. We don't have infinite resources and to vote yes to a blank cheque with no transparency, no accountability and no understanding about what this is going to cost um, is going to be devastating. We've already seen it in the Northern Territory where the Albanese government has funnelled money towards the Yes campaign, taking it from Indigenous schools. And we're seeing it here with our own state-based voice, where we've recently had an advertisement uh, for a director of the Voice Secretariat for up to $300,000. Um, most South Australians, I think, will catch on that this campaign has been misleading from the beginning. It's targeted pe people's emotions. It's been disingenuous because we know that the Indigenous population already have a voice. And I I'm really hoping we're going to see South Australians vote no. Yeah, I'm with you there. But let's just talk about this South Australian voice to Parliament. They've already got one, but it was no sooner passed through the, the Parliament and announced, and I think they said there's going to be 100 members of it, right. than it was suspended. Now, I smell a rat in the sense of they're going, we don't want this to be known by the general public about what's going to happen and how they're going to go about their business until the national voice referendum is decided, because I think it'll it'll be terribly damaging to the yes case if they'd started up. Is that about right? I think that's right. I mean, I would say that most South Australians are only catching on now that we've actually sort of almost stealthily uh, passed a state-based voice without consultation. I think a lot of South Australians won't be happy about that. And to realise that, yes, we have 100 members or over 100 members already uh, in this state-based voice with the potential to create more members uh, with guaranteed resourcing at enormous cost. I think it's certainly uh, got the ability to work against the Albanese government. Yeah, it certainly does. Hey, um, the National Party have had their love in and they're now clashing over energy policy. We've got Barnaby Joyce, Keith Pitt and Matt Canavan, three really smart, intelligent blokes, backing a nuclear policy overhaul and a push to ditch the coalition-backed net zero emissions target. Where does One Nation sit on both nuclear and net zero? Well, I think it's clear, Corey, that um, the quest for net zero is going to send the country bankrupt. And uh, One Nation's been quite clear that we absolutely support nuclear energy. I mean, other countries are either building nuclear reactors or they're increasing the nuclear generating capacity. So worldwide, nuclear energy uh, generating capacity is increasing. Um, and Australia is out of the game for no good reason. And instead, we're pursuing uh, the rabbit hole of renewable energy, which has no good business case. So I absolutely support uh, uh, nuclear energy in this country. Yeah, and net zero is, as you say, going to send us broke. It's just, it's, it's an impossible dream, and yet the three major parties, and four if you count the Greens, who are a fringe major party, um, they've all signed up to it. It's, it's just a disgrace for the country. 
it really shows no respect for those people that are really struggling with our cost of living crisis. They can't afford their energy bills. Uh, it's stopping them getting on the housing market. It's stopping them uh, really buying the food that they need to eat as well. It's, it's completely out of touch with where most Australians are at. It certainly is. Now, Sarah, I got an email this week inviting me to an international men's day event that you've got planned for later this year. Tell us a bit about it. Well, most men who hear about International Men's Day say to me, we didn't even know there was one, but you can't miss International Women's Day with all the pomp and ceremony that seems to go on. So I just decided uh, this year, I've been advocating for an office for men and a minister for men. Obviously, that's uh, going to take some time to persuade the government. So I decided I'd organise my own International Men's Day event, which is on the 19th of November. It's the only one uh, occurring in South Australia, but we've already sold 100 tickets and we're hoping to sell another 40 to 80 more. That's incredible. The only one in South Australia, That's International right. Men's Day. I've just been paying out all the, the virtue signalling days we have, but you make a very good point. Everyone knows about International Women's Day. That's right. Well, men actually live uh, shorter lives, Corey, and they have less healthy lives. And obviously they take their lives more and they suffer from a number of health conditions. So it's really important. But I don't want this day to be uh, necessarily all about that. It's about celebrating men uh, and being proud to be men and celebrating our role models. Yeah, and for all those disadvantages that men have, I don't know too many men who want to be women and I don't know too many women who want to be men. I think, you know, we're very happy in the, the, the cards that we've been dealt. Sarah Game, thank you very much for joining me on Bernardi. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you so much.